Hi, folks. Welcome to another episode of Film Study. This is Ken McCusick. We're here for this week's episode of Friday Morning GM with Voss Laricos. Voss, how are you doing? Doing very well, Ken. Enjoying the bye week so far yourself? Yep. Happy happy to have it here. Unusual kind of to, to, to be happy about the bye week, but just the Ravens position, uh, lateness of the season, the, the, the ability to kind of wait to have some other teams stumble. You could do that any bye week, I guess, during the season. But I guess uh, a lot of the need, too, for the Ravens to have a week off with, with Matt Abike's, uh concussion. Uh, occurring you never know if you're going to be back in one week normally but there's a much better chance you're back in two so uh that's a that's a good one anyway i'm i'm real happy about the bye week how about you absolutely no completely agree uh sitting in good position um with some tough games on tap and several players nursing nagging injuries so should be uh beneficial for sure we got a cool episode today. Uh, Spencer Peterson, who's been a guest on this show before, uh, coming back uh, actually uh, on Film Study Shorts. Let's just be real clear about this. Uh, is is on tonight? He, he actually wanted to talk about some ways that the Ravens can acquire 2024 draft capital, which seems uh, incredible that we would be at this point because uh, everybody on Twitter, of course, has traded away every bit of our 2024 <laughs> draft capital. <laughs> trying to make every trade this season. But anyway, uh, Spencer, glad to have you here. Uh, why don't you talk us through your topic a little bit and, and some some ideas you had for for how the Ravens could acquire draft capital. Of course, and thanks for having me, Ken. Um, so as we look at the 2024 draft, the Ravens currently have seven picks on the board, which will likely increase to eight once they receive the comp pick for Ben Powers. As we're entering the post-Lamar contract era, you'd really like that number to be closer to you know, 9 or 10 or even 11 picks per year to have that influx of young, cheap, controllable talent coming into the organization. So I wanted to talk through a little bit how could we potentially add draft capital to the 2024 uh, draft and uh, initially thought of a couple of levers that the team might be able to pull to add net new value uh, to the 2024 draft. All right. So. Well- I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you cut you off there here, but uh, take us through what what are your what are your ways? So, first lever I was thinking of was: is there an opportunity to reset some of the value from the 2022 draft, particularly at the tight end position? I know you've mentioned it on this show. Uh, obviously, super unfortunate injury to Mark Andrews, but there is a silver lining that uh, a very small silver lining, given the magnitude of Andrews' absence, but that uh, likely and Kolar have the opportunity to. Uh, show something at the tight end position with the opportunity that's been given to them. And we've got one game of that so far. And uh, likely you seem to put it together here in this game. I, I'm I'm hopeful about what can happen. Kolar, you know, he was in there as a blocker some, but but what do you think a, a player like that, if you're, you're, you're probably going to want to trade likely if you're going to get any significant draft capital for Kolar, what would you expect to get? So, for both of them, they both have two years of control remaining. Obviously, we've seen more out of likely. The window, and this is a very large window, but both were in similar positions. Josh Oliver, when the team acquired him, was a seventh-round pick for the compensation. And Hayden Hurst, there's a little bit of change around it, but essentially a second-round pick. So mm-hmm. very wide range there. Somewhere below Hayden Hurst at a second, somewhere above Josh Oliver at a seventh. Potentially, maybe the original dra- round draft value of a fourth, maybe a third for likely, given what teams have seen from him and some of that a potential downside is mitigated. I would be interested in a third for likely for sure. I'm not sure he's worth that. If he was picked uh, 134th, I believe, and he only has two more years left as opposed to, you know, having four years team control at that point. There also was a pretty good influx of tight end talent in the last draft class. So, uh, but if, he, if they could get a high pick, um, I think that'd probably be more beneficial than keeping one of either, either one of those guys around. If I were to, you know, just guess at what the value might be, I think for likely you acquire a fourth and trade a fifth, maybe is is kind of the range of value I would think you might get for him. And for Kolar, I think he's probably a seventh at this point. I think people are, would consider him more closer to being released, but there may be some team that says, "Hey, he'd fit us pretty well." I don't, I don't even think you get a sixth round pick for him um, at this point, given that he hasn't really done anything for the Ravens. Uh, any other tradable pieces? The tight ends are are two that you're you're talking about. Are there any other tradable players on the team? 
So the obvious place to look would be anywhere, again, if we're thinking about resetting draft value, would be anywhere where we double dipped at a position. The only position that fits that, uh, that mold or that criteria from 2022 would be the cornerback position. And obviously between uh, Armour Davis and um, the name's escaping me right now, the, the nickel corner Pepe. that they have. Exactly. Pepe I, I don't think there's any value for either of those at this point. Okay. That's really the issue. I think that it's a great idea to trade surplus when you have a log jam at a certain position, but there's not a whole lot of positions where they have a log jam right now. Yeah. Yeah. So ultimately likely is the one who probably is at the top of the list. And I think the, the conversation we've talked about makes a lot of sense but some team would have to view him as a potential starting option uh, that they were trying to de-risk the position relative to a rookie they might bring at a, at a mid-round pick. All right. Well, things can change in a hurry. If, of course, if likely plays the rest of the year and he looks pretty good, first of all, the Ravens are going to want to keep him, obviously, if that's the case. But but if he does play pretty well, then then he might be uh, of, of greater value than I would see it being right now. But I, honestly, if Hayden Hurst is you get back a second after – you know, two years after t- or taking him as a first, I think likely you know, two years after taking him as a fourth, you don't really do much better than that. So uh, let's let's uh, move on and and uh, talk about your second idea. Yeah, so the next lever that the team could potentially pull is uh, basically moving forward the value for one of their top departing free agents where they might get a compensatory pick or would likely get a compensatory pick in the 2025 draft, potentially tagging and trading one of those top options. So Matabike, uh, Patrick Queen, or Geno Stone. All right. Um, so Matabike, the, the the tag is very significant for that, Vasa. We've been over that before, right? The number is 19, enormous. 19 for Matabike. Yeah, uh, Adam Schefter, there was a news release this week or, uh, that – the Ravens were pressing hard to re-sign Matabike last offseason. He decided to bet on himself, play out the year. Obviously, it looks like that's going to work out for him pretty well. Schefter did say they may consider the tag. Uh, it would be $19 million, upwards of 19 for Matabike. Um, even Queen, because there is no inside-out linebacker, outside linebacker designation, the $21 million for a linebacker is the tag number. And uh, offensive line uh, – or even if you wanted to look at Zeitler, just for example, that would be $18 million. So uh, Matabike would be the one um, so that, that would potentially make some sense. Okay, well, let's, yeah. let's, let's talk about all three of those for a second here. At, at $19 million, and I'll go back to you on the Spencer, is, is, do you think there's a reasonable tag and trade opportunity there for uh, another team? I mean, I, I guess his value could be somewhat in flux, but if a team wants to sign him for – Let's say uh, five years for 125 million, or thereabouts. Is there tag and trade value there if the if the Ravens can tag him for 19? Well, I think there's there's two parts to that question. First is what the Ravens can tag him for. I think the team has to be willing to sit on that tag amount if no trade materializes. I think that's the first component. And I think Matabike of those options, and especially the tag amounts you just listed out, Voss, is the one that makes the most sense. In terms of what is the compensation coming the other way, not the exact same uh, position, but along the defensive front, what the Bears just traded for Sweat from uh, Washington, I believe it was, basically for the right to negotiate a contract with him, given they're not going anywhere this year. That second round pick, maybe third or second round pick compensation uh, is probably a good analog with similar contract numbers to what you just referenced. All right. Any possibility that would work with with either Queen or Zeitler or even Geno Stone, say? So I think the complication is that teams would know that the Ravens really don't have an alternative of sitting on that uh, tag number, which makes their bargaining position a lot weaker. Uh, So it's kind of a tough proposition there. Probably a round or two down if you're talking about what's the compensation outside some of the, the game theory of negotiations there. But uh, ultimately, Matabike, I think, is the one that makes the most sense. I think that's a great point in terms of it really ruins your your negotiating position when they know you can't eat that tag. And if you tag somebody, you better be ready to sit on it. That's uh, that's certainly you know, a good practice anyway. All right. Well, let's go on to the next idea then. What's your third? So this is probably the furthest out there uh, of the ideas. But there's been a lot of talk about do we cut Stanley, Ronnie Stanley in the offseason season. Do we have him come back as a starting tackle option? I think there's a third option here. Do you potentially trade Ronnie Stanley? And 
the first reaction is probably why would anyone trade for Ronnie Stanley if we're looking to shed his contract? You know, he's not a good value. But given that he does have two years on the contract remaining and unencumbered from the prorated bonus portion, there is a team that could look at that as a low risk move, you know, at most a one year, $15 million commitment to bring in an offensive tackle that, you know, if he writes the ship to any degree, the remaining part of the season to have a averageish starting left tackle that could be valuable to a team that sees itself uh, on the ascension without an established tackle starter and who doesn't have the same need to clear the balance sheet that the Ravens have. I think it's, that's really the key. Ronnie needs to perform well during the last uh, quarter of the season, especially coming off of that game last week. I do wonder if his dependability will depreciate his value just because he's missed so many games the uh, last three years, really. Um, but just the nagging injuries, I think that'd be great if they could get something back for him, $15 million for the team as the base. I think it's $11 million base, $4 million roster bonus. Um I don't know. I don't think he's necessarily worked that right now, but he could be with good play down stretch. So it's 15 and 24 and 20 and 25. So it's a, it's a two year, $35 million option. And I think if you didn't value that, you wouldn't make the move right now. I'm afraid to say, I just don't see another team out there that would be willing to go 35 million for two years uh, or, or 15 million for one, for that matter. It's just, it's a, it's a really that's a really risky proposition for a guy who's had a lot of trouble staying on the field and when he's been on the field unfortunately in 23 hasn't looked good. So uh uh while while I while I hope the, the Ravens could get someone I'm just I'm, I'm you know it's 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 good thought experiment I'm just not sure that would work. I think it's possible just because of the of the dearth of tackle talent maybe the Ravens Take on more, restructure the deal. I mean, usually they're the ones that are asking the other team to eat some cap. Aaron Rodgers' season is officially over, but yours has just begun at my bookie. NFL, college ball, and a brand new cash out system gives you options to bet and win all season long. First two legs of your parlay hit, cash out early and place another bet, or let it ride for a chance at an even bigger payday. Join us at my bookie for an entire season filled with daily odd boosts same gay parlays, and huge prize pool contests. Right now, MyBookie has a no-strings-attached cash bonus that lets you deposit and withdraw quick. Use the promo code RAVENS on your first deposit of $50 or more, and you can receive up to $200 in cash instantly credited to your MyBookie account. That's promo code RAVENS to claim your cash bonus now. You can bet anything, anytime, anywhere, only with MyBookie. Uh I don't know. It's, it'd be tough. Bowser was the other one. That'd be great if you could trade away all your chronically injured players. That'd be a, that'd be great. Yeah, there's a there's a um, if the Ravens cut Stanley, the total amount of divisible benefit in terms of salary that the Ravens could eat is only eight million. It's only the savings, right? Because they can't they, if they if they gave away nine million. Well, I guess they could be buying a draft pick, which would be that would be odd, I think. Um, but uh, but the, the total amount, if they if they if they wanted it to be cap neutral, is eight million is the total amount they they have available for it. Right. Yeah. Ultimately, this one is a little tough because there's a very tight needle to thread. If Stanley writes the ship and his play justifies another team being willing to give up draft capital for him, there's a very high likelihood at that point the Ravens would rather just retain him, given it's very hard to replace a starting caliber left tackle on an eight million dollar savings or you know, absent a top 10 pick if, or period. <laughs> it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's an <laughs> enormous barrier. And, and uh, you have Moses who will have to be replaced by the end of 25 or resigned, you know, one or the other. Um, and, you know, it's unfortunate, honestly, that Moses is, is outplaying Stanley pretty significantly right now. And as I'm scoring it, McCary is outplaying Stanley pretty significantly at this point. Uh, if you want to talk grade levels, McCary's outscoring him by about one grade level and Moses by about two grade levels in their time at tackle. And, um, it's just it's it's not a good place to be. I I I don't see an easy solution for this, but they're going to need two tackles by by the end of 2025, and uh, and at least one of them has got to be ready to. Um, uh, sorry, by the beginning of 2025, I think at least one of them has to has to be able to start in 24. Agreed, agreed. It, they, the roster is just kind of leveraged at this point. 
with a franchise quarterback, with a franchise middle linebacker, where they've kind of stripped off some of the excess and they're pretty much bare bones and there's not a lot of disposable players to trade away. But I think there are a couple more options to to maybe um, add some more capital. And obviously the, the, the uh, obvious one is to trade down out of the first round. Ravens are projected right now, obviously a little long way to go, but 31st pick. That's worth about 600 points, which is roughly equivalent to two late second round picks. Um, Ravens haven't had a great history of trading out of the first when uh, I believe Sergio Kindle and Courtney Upshaw were the two players they received both times they traded out of the first. But, uh, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean it's not a, a great idea. Good idea. They, and they traded it back into the first early to get Kyle Bowler, gave up the, the next round's pick, and then uh, that didn't work out all that well for them. Uh, it there, I guess it can be done, but uh, but hard to go without that. Um, uh, uh, that pick is it if you're looking to rejigger where the Ravens have their draft capital in this draft, where are you willing to give up and where do you want to pick up in terms of are you looking to get a two for a couple of threes? Are you looking to get a you know a three for a couple of fours? What are you trying to do in terms of? of moving in a particular spot, given the Ravens fairly broad set of needs for next year with all the, the uh, UFAs. Uh, well, I personally always prefer top 100 picks. I think uh, once you get down to day three, the odds of success diminish significantly, especially at the positions where the Ravens need players, uh, the premium positions that get pushed up the board. Um, so I, I like to try to accumulate um, picks on, you know, really in the top 50. A lot of times that that first 10, 15 picks of the second round are, are kind of overflow first rounders. And after that, uh, it kind of falls off. Those are like the, the last of the plug and play guys, usually about number 45 or 50. Well, I think it's fair to say if you're looking to pick, get additional picks in the top 50, the only thing you have you can trade is the number one pick. Of course. Yep. All right. Spencer. All right. Fairly similar. I think uh, the team has definitely shown. Uh, a propensity or desire to really stack that third and fourth round uh, bucket. So a little bit lower than you're mentioning Voss. I think the one uh, risk or the one concern that if you're trying to drop back out of the first to accumulate additional seconds or in that top 50 range is just the value of that fifth year option associated with the first round pick. You know, if, as I think you've mentioned quite a few times, Ken, if the obvious pick is an offensive tackle there, there's just so much value in that extra year of team control versus immediately being under the gun for market rates for a long-term uh, extension if that pick does, in fact, hit. Yeah, it's, it's a great point. And, and obviously, when you when all offensive linemen get combined, you, you're that much more um, uh, likely to want to have that, that value at, at left tackle specifically. So uh, a, 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 a tough draft. It's supposed to be a good tackle draft, which is something. I'm just, you know, by number 31, a lot of it may be gone in terms of the Ravens. And you look at the big three last year, who are the big three cross Neil and who's the third one. I'm, I'm, I'm um, forgetting for a moment. Slater, right? No, that's, he's before you're going yeah, back to, you're going back two years. Uh, it's, 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 it's the cross and Neil draft. And I'm trying to remember who, who is the third offensive tackle. Uh, it, Tevin Jenkins. Tevin Is he the guy out of NC state. Um, his name's uh, a quantum, a quantum. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes, that's the one. All right. Iquana. So, so you know when you're when you're looking at that draft, even I mean Neil right now is at the very bottom of PFF's rankings of all tackles. You know, and and that's uh, you know a shame. I think Cross is somewhere in the middle, um, and uh, and Aquano, I, I I don't recall looking for actually at the time, but um, it it's you know you don't have a guarantee of immediate success at offensive tackle. It's often a, a you know bad year you're going to have to live through, which is an additional barrier to this thing. I kind of hope that they could solve the problem by taking a guy who's even a little bit lower. Falele does not look like he's going to come through as a developmental left tackle. Um, He might still be a guy they could get coached up and playing at right tackle, but he's got so far to go from right now in terms of his change of physicality and whatnot. Um, I don't want to, to, to hijack the conversation in terms of how you can acquire draft capital, but I think, you know, how you look at a player like that, and his chance to to even fill in for Moses for one year after Moses is gone, say, um, is might have to be part of the tackle solution, even even if not optimal. 
Agreed. Definitely agree with that. The, the final, unless you had a thought on that, Spencer, I was going to a final avenue that at least it came to my mind as far as acquiring more picks in the 24 draft class is trading away 2025 draft capital. The reason why, well, ordinarily there's a one round discount um, if you're if you're trading into the future. But the reason why that could make some sense is the Ravens are, I would say, probable to receive the maximum of four compensatory picks uh, this offseason that would be applied next offseason. Um uh, Obviously, Matabike, Queen, Zeitler, Geno Stone, Jadavian Clowney, and Beckham, I think, could all uh, factor into the compensatory formula. So if you're looking to kind of uh, equalize resources from 24 and 25 because they borrowed probably five times as much void years, I think it's 23 million void year uh, deferral off the 24 cap uh, compared to only about 5 million off the 25 cap. That could be a way to kind of maneuver your draft capital around a little bit, even though you do pay that premium for the year deferral. Yeah, fully agreed. I think there's a huge marginal benefit from going to from eight picks in 2024 up to nine. That's very much worth the drop from a projected 11 picks in 2025. I guess that would be down to 10. I think, again, the value of going from eight to nine this upcoming draft outweighs the drop that you would have from 11 to 10, even factoring in potentially that that discount that you referenced. So it would be, you know, to, to be safe about this, you'd probably want to trade a 2025 fifth or a fourth, one or the other. It wouldn't be a third because that's that's too risky. You might not get that. You might end up trading your own third. But the key is you want to trade a floater, you know, so one there where it's a it's a it's a pick to be named later that uh, uh, th- that ends up hopefully being a pick very much at the end of that round uh, if the Ravens have a good 2025 season. Uh, but it, it is, it, it'd be a possibility. It, it's, uh, you know, there's no silver bullet in any of these named. And the reason is that, that, you know, significant draft capital to draft a tackle is just not available from any of these five options. You know, you know, there's not a mid first round pick available in, in, in any of the ways you can do this. And we just shouldn't expect this because real life isn't like that movie draft day where, you know, you trade three number ones and you and you, you know, <laughs> all the stuff that the Browns did in that movie, uh, you know, isn't real. So th- this, uh, uh, you know, this is, a, this is a problem probably without us without an easy solution here for the uh, for the Ravens. But it really would be something if they could pull a uh, rabbit out of their hat on this and find a left tackle for one of the next two seasons. Agreed. Agreed. The other just solution I bring to mind, they are, they do have a lot of holes um, upcoming. We, we, Ken and I previewed that in the, in the two previous episodes of this series, but uh, if they do make a run and in the playoffs, they may be able to kind of keep that pipeline of those capable veterans on very cheap deals Jadavian Clowney, Ronald Darby type, keep that going the next few years while they're in this window. Um, and that's another way to kind of flesh out your depth chart without quite as many draft picks. Are, are they in a position already where they're committed to that scheme at, say, um, edge? Because they're just not going to have the, their draft capital to, to get an edge early unless they ignore their tackle needs. And they've certainly been very good at finding the, the cheap edge. Is, is is there any other alternative for them than that? I mean, BPA, you know, this I think this year might put BPA to the test. If if the BPA is a is a edge rusher, then uh you'd probably go there instead of tackle. So I remains to be seen. All right. All right. Uh Spencer, really appreciate you joining us. Can you tell folks where they can talk football with you online? Yeah, you can find me on Twitter or X or whatever we're referring to it as these days at Spencer CP. That's S P E N S E R C P. All right, outstanding. Voss, how about you? I am at Vasilis Beatdown, V A S I L A S Beatdown on Twitter X, uh, also at Baltimore Beatdown. And uh, Spencer, appreciate you joining us for bringing this topic to our discussion. Thanks for having me. Other folks out there, if you'd like to be on a film study short, hit me up. DMs are always open on Twitter. I want to talk to you, particularly during the bye week here. There's a lot of options for that, and we're, we're recording some of those um, as we go. For Vasilikos, this is Ken McCusick saying goodbye, and we'll talk to you next week on Friday Morning GM.